the sounds of the conflict were terrible. The rapid firing of our guns amid the clouds of smoke mingled with the crash of solid shot against our sides and the bursting of shells all around us. William Keeler, USS Monitor. The roar of the battle above and the thud and vibration of the huge masses of iron being hurled against us all together produced a scene and sound to be compared only with the poet's picture of the lower regions. Ashton Ramsey, CSS Virginia. Sunday, March 9th, 1862. The waters of Hampton Roads, Virginia, churned with violence. This day marked history's first test of iron against iron. The brute force of the Confederates, Virginia, had been tearing holes into the Federal blockade. The Union's monitor had steamed in to stop the Virginia and save the wooden fleet. The Confederate vessel was simply a massive iron fort built on the hull of the wreck of the wooden frigate Merrimack, a sunken Union vessel raised by the rebels and rechristened the CSS Virginia. The whole idea of an ironclad is an ironclad is equal to 10, 15 wooden ships. Uh, they just can't do any damage to it. Principally, you're taking an existing wooden hull, building on top of it the iron platform that they can install the heaviest battery that they could bring to bear on the enemy. Ten guns, ten huge cannons. Uh, CSS Virginia wreaked havoc upon these wooden warships. The Union's monitor was a controversial design. Her iron decks rose just 18 inches above the waterline and she carried only two guns mounted side by side in a revolving turret. The design of the monitor was quite radical. And most innovative of all was the turret, which rotated to bring two guns to bear on a target. And because the turret could be rotated without moving the ship, the two guns gave the same advantage as a ship that could fire 10 or 12 guns broadside. A vessel like this had never been seen before, and crews had not performed jobs like this crew was performing. The crew was making history with every shot they fired. For the spectators gathered on the banks watching the furious battle, it was a strange and awesome sight. In this era of grand sailing ships, neither vessel had a sail, and as the cannon shots bounced off their iron armor, the shock echoed around the world. All of the world's major navies immediately began planning the construction of ironclad fleets. Sooner or later, the world was going to discover that the day of wooden ships was over. It had to happen somewhere and it had to happen sometime. It was the conjunction of events and technology that dictated that it happened in America at Hampton Roads in the form of the Monitor and the Virginia. Their successful designs laid the foundation for a fleet of ironclad vessels that served gallantly for both sides during the Civil War and beyond. The real need for iron armor came in the early 1800s with the advancements of explosive artillery shells. These were huge, hollow, cannonballs that were to be fired at wooden ships. When the actual cannonball penetrated the wooden ship, it would explode. And a few bursts of these cannonballs would literally tear a ship apart. In 1859, the French built La Guerre. She was a steamer of conventional design, but her sides were protected with four and a half inches of iron plate. The British followed with the warrior, an iron-cased warship weighing over 9,000 tons. The United States Navy lagged behind. Their 420-foot Stevens battery weighed 6,000 tons and carried seven guns. But the massive ship was under construction for seven years and was never completed.
At the start of the Civil War, President Lincoln approved a plan to use the Northern Navy to help strangle the Confederacy. Less than a week after the fall of Fort Sumter, which would be mid-April of 1861, Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation decreeing that a blockade was going to be declared on all ports in the South. For all practical purposes, the Confederacy had no Navy, nor did it have the maritime ocean-going vessels that they could convert into a Navy. So that whatever the Confederacy had literally had to be cobbled together from what existed or built from scratch. Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, had followed ironclad development in Europe and recognized their potential for the Southern cause. I regard the possession of an iron armored ship as a matter of the first necessity. Such a vessel at this time could traverse the entire coast of the United States, prevent all blockades, and encounter with fair prospect of success their entire Navy. Stephen Mallory, 1861. In April of 1861, federal troops withdrew from Gosport Navy Yard in Virginia. They attempted to destroy the entire facility and every ship left behind. The frigate USS Merrimack was burned to the waterline and sunk. When the first ironclad ideas were presented, it was evident they would be too expensive and take too much time to build and require too much technology that the South didn't have. So it was a stroke of sort of ersatz genius to realize that the Merrimack was completely intact. It was just underwater. They could cut off months of work by taking that existing ship from that river bottom, raising it and building their ironclad on the top of it. Architects of the new ship were Lieutenant John M. Brooke and naval constructor John L. Porter. Their design was simple but effective. The iron housing, or casemate, was sloped at a 35-degree angle to deflect enemy fire. Inside were 10 cannons, four on each side, and a pivot gun on each end. The casemate of the CSS Virginia was first backed up with 24 inches of solid wood, solid oak. They also had two layers of two-inch iron, totaling four inches altogether. This was overlaid over top of this two feet thick uh, oak layer to protect the crew and the guns on the inside. The big hope for doing terrible destruction to Yankee ships for the Virginia on the part of her builders was the ram or beak on the prow of the vessel. It was something that couldn't be seen. It was about a foot and a half below the waterline. It was a massive iron sort of tooth sticking out from the bow. The real damage was to be done by getting up a full head of steam and driving this ram right through the bowels of an enemy ship, forcing it to sink virtually instantaneously. Throughout the summer and fall of 1861, the Confederacy worked frantically to complete the great vessel. Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond rose 723 tons of iron plate. While in dry dock at Gosport, more than 1,500 workers labored night and day. Her great size, strength, and powerful engines and speed, combined with the invulnerability secured by the iron casting, will make the dispersal or the destruction of the blockading fleet an easy task for her. We hope soon to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career on the seas. Mobile, Alabama Register, 1861. Throughout the North, rumors spread quickly about the Confederates' iron monster, and panic began to build. The Northern newspapers were full of accounts of the building of this dreadful iron behemoth down south. The great fear in the North was that this vessel would somehow steam up the Atlantic, steam up the Potomac, bombard Washington itself, wreak havoc all the way up and down the East Coast. The Union set out to create its own ironclad to counter the Southern menace. 
the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, established a board to field proposals for the new ship. In the end, they got 17 designs, uh, several of them impractical. But it came down to two or three basic designs that appeared to have the most promise. One of them was a conventional warship, which later was built, called the Galena, which would simply have iron uh, lap streaking on its sides, rather like clappered siding, one laid over the other. The inventor of the Galena, Cornelius Bushnell, visited inventor John Erickson to get some advice on his design. And in the course of their discussion, Erickson almost offhandedly said, oh, by the way, would you like to see the design I have for a virtually impregnable warship made of iron? And in fact, what he showed to Bushnell was essentially the design for what became the Monitor. Swedish immigrant Erickson was a brilliant designer, credited with many breakthrough inventions, including the screw propeller for ships. In 1854, he had proposed an ironclad vessel to Napoleon III. This vessel had a rotating gun platform protected by a dome of iron. Ericsson is an egotistical, annoying, very, very difficult man. Very few people liked him. Furthermore, while he had created a number of very important inventions, he had also done one or two that were failures, and these did not put him in good stead with the Navy Department, the most uh, uh, glaring of which was the USS Princeton, which he designed largely and in the 1840s when it was being tried out, a gun aboard the ship exploded and among other things killed a secretary of the Navy. Erickson was unjustly blamed for the accident and vowed he would never set foot in the Navy Department again. So Bushnell asked if he could take Erickson's design to Washington. In September of 1861, Bushnell showed the plans to President Lincoln. All I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot in the stocking. Strikes me there's something in it. Abraham Lincoln, 1861. But the Naval Board resisted the unconventional design. So Erickson himself came to Washington and convinced him. Gentlemen, after what I have said, I consider it to be your duty to the country to give me an order to build the vessel before I leave this room. John Erickson, 1861. Contracts were drawn, and on October 25, 1861, construction began. The Monitor incorporated a number of innovations, including a very shallow draft, because she was designed primarily for river and harbor defense. She rode very low in the water. Virtually all of this vessel was below the water. Her engines, the crew's quarters, the officer's quarters, the galley, magazine, everything was below the water line. The Monitor was designed to only have 18 inches of freeboard, which is the amount that the sides uh, were out of the water. And Erickson's idea there was that there was, would be little to shoot at. The ship was completely surrounded with an overhanging armor belt. It was five feet deep and was covered with five inches of iron plate. This protected the sides of the hull against ramming. Near the bow was the pilot house. From here, the captain and the helmsman would guide the ship during battle. But the key to Erickson's design was the rotating turret. His idea was to have this revolving turret, which would allow the, the body of the vessel to take any position, and they could aim the guns to whatever object they wanted. The turret was nine feet high and 21 feet in diameter. The iron plate was eight inches thick, and in total, the turret weighed 120 tons. Inside were two giant guns mounted side by side. Having only two guns on a, on a man of war is, in, it alone is, is a novel idea, but uh, these are, are the largest naval guns afloat. I mean, they're 11 inch guns. So yes, it's novel, but uh, that was Ericsson. <laughs> 
In battle, the guns could fire about every five minutes. The turret could rotate two and a half times a minute. Top speed of the monitor was about eight knots. To complete this monumental task, Ericsson farmed out the construction to various builders throughout the North. And in just 120 days, the building of the monitor was complete. The confidence level when the monitor was launched was apparently very low. People lined up to watch it launch, to watch it sink. They were convinced Ericsson's folly, as it was called, would not float. However, on January 30th, 1862, in Greenpoint, New York, the monitor slid down the ways exactly as Ericsson had planned. I congratulate you and trust you will be a success. Hurry her for sea as the Merrimack is nearly ready at Norfolk and we wish to send her there. Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gustavus Fox. Commanding the new vessel was Lieutenant John Worden, a veteran of the U.S. Navy since 1834. His executive officer was 21-year-old Lieutenant Samuel Dana Green, who would command the guns in the turret. 58 crewmen took their positions on the new ship. Dear Anna, yesterday I saw my iron home for the first time, but I shall not attempt a description of it now. But you may rest assured your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he were seated at home with you. William Keeler, USS Monitor. On February 20th, Lieutenant Worden received his sailing orders. Proceed with the U.S. steamer Monitor under your command to Hampton Roads, Virginia. Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. of 1862, after nine months of construction, the Virginia was ready. She was vastly different from the Union's monitor. At 262 feet, she was 90 feet longer, four times heavier, and drew 22 feet of water, more than twice the draft of the monitor. On March 8th, Virginia steamed out of Gulfport Navy Yard on her maiden voyage. In an instant, the whole city was in an uproar. Women, children, men on horseback and on foot, running down towards the river from every conceivable direction, shouting, the Merrimack is going down. Norfolk of Baybrook, 1862. In command was Captain Franklin Buchanan, a 46-year naval veteran. His executive officer was Lieutenant Kate Speed Jones, a naval ordnance expert. The crew of the Virginia numbered 350 men. From the start, we saw that she was slow, not over five knots. She steered so badly that with her great length, it took from 30 to 40 minutes to turn around. She was as unmanageable as a waterlogged vessel. John Taylor Wood, CSS Virginia. The engines were from the original sailing vessel Merrimack and had problems powering the heavy iron ship. The steam plants that were originally installed were uh, very inefficient. Uh, they were designed for only short periods of steaming, and they were uh, principally underpowered. A magnificent wooden ship, but a very bad, bad steamship as far as the engines were concerned. In spite of her problems, the Virginia headed for Hampton Roads in the blockading Union fleet. Sailors, 
In a few minutes, you will have the long expected opportunity to show your devotion to our cause. Remember that you are about to strike for your country, for your homes, for your wives, and for your children. Beat to quarters. Captain Franklin Buchanan, CSS Virginia. When the Virginia steams into Hampton Roads, consternation immediately went through the Federal fleet, chiefly among the four major vessels that were there, the Cumberland, the Congress, the Minnesota, and the Roanoke, which are big, powerful, but unfortunately wooden warships. As soon as the Virginia came within range of the guns on the Federal fleet, they began to fire at it, but of course their firing was virtually ineffectual and that the Virginia simply kept coming on. Firing her own guns, by the way, but obviously aiming to ram straight into the first ship she could find. Captain Buchanan chose his first target, the USS Cumberland. The shot and the shell from the Merrimack crashed through the wooden sides of the Cumberland as if they had been made of paper carrying huge splinters with them and dealing death and destruction on every hand. The once clean and beautiful deck was slippery with blood, blackened with powder, and looked like a slaughterhouse. Charles O'Neill, USS Cumberland. She looked like a huge, half-submerged crocodile. At her prow, I could see the iron ram projecting straight forward. It was impossible for our vessel to get out of her way. A.B. Smith, USS Cumberland. The Virginia drove her iron ram deep into the Cumberland and the ship began to sink immediately. However, the ram stuck inside and the Virginia was in danger of being brought down as well. Finally, the ram broke off and the Virginia pulled away. It would be several days before the Virginia realized her ram was missing. In less than one hour, one of the most powerful ships in the Federal Navy had been destroyed with 121 men lost. The Virginia suffered just two men killed and eight wounded. Once the Cumberland is out of the way, the Virginia turns its attention to the USS Congress, a much more formidable ship. Again, there is the, the battle of the blazing guns as the Virginia approaches, and the Congress soon catches fire from incendiary shells being fired at it, and it's virtually unmanageable. The Congress soon surrendered, but the Virginia's Captain Buchanan was wounded in the battle. Lieutenant Kate Speed Jones assumed command. Jones then sees as his mission to go after the Minnesota, which in the panic to get away from the Virginia, the Minnesota has run aground and is stuck. However, it was moving towards nightfall and in fear of running the Virginia aground, Jones decided to return home and wait until morning to destroy the Minnesota. While the Virginia enjoyed her glorious victory, the Monitor struggled down the coast. She met rough weather and was leaking badly. Water poured down the blower stacks and extinguished the boiler fires. The fires burned with a sickly blaze, converting all the air in the engine and fire rooms into carbonic acid gas a few inhalations of which are sufficient to destroy animal life. Alvin Steimers, USS Monitor. Most of the crew had to pose themselves out on the upper deck in these high seas with the water coming over, etc. The, wa the Monitor came fairly close to foundering. The resourceful crew managed to survive the hardships, and at 9 p.m. on March 8th, the Monitor steamed into Hampton Roads. It 
It's one of the most interesting accidental conjunctions in history that the Monitor should finally arrive on the scene just as the first day's battle was ending and just in time to be present for the second. We could see the fine old Congress burning brightly. Sadly, indeed, did we feel to think those two fine old vessels had gone to their last homes with so many of their brave crews. Our hearts were so very full, and we vowed vengeance to the Merrimack. Samuel Dana Green, USS Monitor. We looked eagerly out over the bay. There was the Minnesota lying aground where she had struck the evening before, and near her was the strangest looking craft we had ever seen before. John Eggleston, CSS Virginia. Such a craft the eyes of a seaman never looked upon before. An immense shingle floating on the water with a gigantic cheese box rising from its center. No sails, no wheels, no smokestack, no guns. What could it be? James Rochelle, CSS Patrick Henry. In the morning of March 9th, few are really expecting to see the monitor. They seem not to have noticed it, in fact, until the monitor fired its first shot. Through the glasses, they saw what some took to be a boiler or part of an engine being removed from the Minnesota, and they thought the puff of smoke from that first shot was the boiler exploding. You can see surprise on a ship just the same as you can see it on a human being. And there was surprise all over the Merrimack. Peter Truscott, USS Monitor. The Monitor could not possibly have made her appearance at a more inopportune time. John Taylor Wood, CSS Virginia. As the vessels closed in on one another, the crew aboard the Monitor waited anxiously for the first test of their untried armor. I experienced a peculiar sensation. I do not think it was fear, but it was different from anything I ever knew before. We were enclosed in what we supposed to be an impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment, and our enemy's first fire might make it a coffin for all of us. Everyone was at his post, fixed like a statue. The most profound silence reigned. If there had been a coward heart there, its throb would have been audible. So intense was the stillness. William Keeler, USS Monitor. quick to reply, returning a rattling broadside, and the battle fairly began. The turret and other parts of the ship were heavily struck, but the shots did not penetrate. A look of confidence passed over the men's faces, and we believed the Merrimack would not repeat the work she had accomplished the day before. Samuel Dana Green, USS Monitor. Once the first shots were fired, for about the next two hours, the two ships gave each other pretty much their undivided attention. Immediately, the superiority of the Monitor's engines became apparent. She literally steamed circles around the Virginia. Monitor had extreme advantages in her draft and in her maneuverability because only the turret had to be moved in order to bring the guns to bear on the Virginia while the whole vessel had to be moved in order to bring the Virginia's guns to bear on the monitor. The fight continued with the exchange of broadsides as fast as the guns could be served and at very short range. The distance between the vessels frequently not more than a few yards. Samuel Dana Green, USS Monitor. On the Virginia, some of the iron plates were beginning to crack and the wood backing was splintering. On the monitor, the turret was dented, but the iron was holding. The monitor circled around and around us, receiving our fire as she went and delivering her own. 
We saw our shells burst into fragments against her turret. I find I can do the monitor as much damage by snapping my finger at her every five minutes. John Eggleston, CSS Virginia. The atmosphere inside the Virginia, once the battle really got going in earnest, had to be like a scene out of Dante's Inferno. Uh, the guns blazing away, powder smoke everywhere, high, incredibly high heat. A hundred and some men, sweating bodies stripped to the waist, serving these guns, firing again and again and again. Aboard the monitor, conditions in the turret were just as bad. Tremendous noises as the shots are ringing off the iron armor, shells exploding, the sound of the Virginia's guns. These vessels were at point-blank range frequently during the four-hour battle. The noise and the heat were tremendous. At times, the gunners could not see in the turret because the smoke was so thick. Even though they had forced ventilation, it was still tremendously hot. Uh, they say it got up to 120 in the turret and even higher in the engine room. The biggest problem was if you were leaning up against the turret bulkhead when a projectile hit it from the outside. It was very severe because this happened during the battle to a couple of men, a couple of the gunners, and they were knocked out. The turret did not work well when the battle began. It was difficult to get it started spinning, and once it started, it was difficult to get it stopped. So frequently, they were shooting on the fly. They really could not stop it in order to fire at the target. They had to take their best guess. About two hours into the battle, Virginia lost track of her position and ran aground. Warden on the monitor very soon spotted this. He now had the great luxury of being able to maneuver the monitor into a position from which none of the Virginia's guns could be aimed at the monitor. But Warden could sit there at rest and plow shot after shot into the, the Virginia's casement. Our situation was critical. We had to take all chances. We lashed down the safety valves, heat quickly burning combustibles into the already raging fires, brought the boilers to a pressure that would have been unsafe under ordinary circumstances. The propeller churned the mud and water furiously, but the ship did not stir. It seemed impossible that the boilers could stand the pressure we were crowding upon them. Just as we were beginning to despair, there was a perceptible movement, and the Merrimack slowly dragged herself off the shoal. We were saved. Ashton Ramsey, CSS Virginia. each other with cannon fire, each ship attempted to ram the other, but with little result. Then, the Virginia fired the single most effective shot of the battle. A heavy shell struck the pilot house. A flash of light and a cloud of smoke filled the house. I noticed the captain stagger and put his hands to his eyes. I ran up to him and asked if he was hurt. My eyes, he said. I am blind. William Keeler, USS Monitor. Executive Officer Samuel Green hurried from the turret to take over for Worden and receive his orders. Gentlemen, I leave it with you. Do what you think best. I cannot see, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota, if you can. John Warden, Captain, USS Monitor. At this point, the Monitor pulled back temporarily to assess the situation. And the Virginia, by this time, is in a bad way itself. The engines are awful, their own ammunition is running low, two of their guns are out of commission from being hit by the Monitor's shells. Jones decides that this is the time to take his ship back into Norfolk. He thinks he has defeated the Monitor. Conversely, seeing the Virginia pull out and head back toward his home port, the men on the Monitor believe that in fact they have driven the Virginia away and that the battle is theirs. So both sides left the battle thinking they had won. It was noon. 
and the first clash of the ironclads was over. But the debate as to who actually won the battle would rage for generations. Wave and handkerchiefs and the wildest shouts of joy, the battle-scarred Virginia steamed slowly back to her moorings. No conqueror of ancient Rome ever enjoyed a prouder triumph than that which greeted us. R.C. Foote, CSS Virginia. Cheer after cheer went up from the frigates and the small craft for the glorious little monitor, and happy indeed did we all feel. I was captain then of the vessel that saved Newport News, Hampton Roads, Fortress Monroe, and perhaps your northern ports. Samuel Dana Green, USS Monitor. There was no clear victor in the Battle of Hampton Roads. The Monitor was not penetrated by shot. There were some dents, some damage to the pilot house. The Virginia apparently had her smokestack shot away and had a bit more damage than the Monitor, but there was no substantial damage to either vessel. Both vessels had a purpose. The Monitor's purpose was to protect the Minnesota that morning, which she successfully did. The Virginia's purpose was to destroy as much of the Federal fleet as she could, which she did the day before. The Monitor and the Virginia never do fire a hostile shot at each other again. And the fact is, the Virginia never does again attempt to go out into Hampton Roads to harass the fleet. She steams out once or twice in the next few weeks to challenge the Monitor to battle again, but the Monitor has nothing to gain from fighting her. The Monitor is there to protect the fleet, which she does to perfection. So essentially, the Virginia is nullified. However, the very presence of the Virginia in the harbor posed a threat to the North. They never realized she was unseaworthy and could never actually steam up the coast. General McClellan's campaign against Richmond was delayed by the menace of the Virginia. The Virginia doesn't last long after the fight. In May 1862, Norfolk itself falls to the Federals, and there's a danger that the Virginia, being cut off and surrounded, may be captured by the Federals and turned against the Confederates. She's too heavy, she draws too much water to get her out over the bar, so there is no alternative but to scuttle her. She's sunk in the river and her superstructure blown up, and the Virginia ceases to be. Still unconquered, we hold down our drooping colors, the laurels all fresh and green, and with mingled pride and grief, gave her to the flames. Ashton Ramsey, CSS Virginia. The Monitor remained in Hampton Roads on blockade duty. Late in the summer, she ventured up the James River for a brief skirmish at Drury's Bluff. But like the Virginia, the Monitor's career was very brief. In December of 1862, she was being towed from Hampton Roads to Beaufort, North Carolina for repairs before being sent on blockade duty in either Charleston or Wilmington, North Carolina. The Monitor was not a seaworthy vessel in terms of being in outside waters in the open ocean, nor was she designed to be. She encountered a gale some 16 miles off the coast of Cape Hatteras and sank in a storm. 16 crewmen were lost. Most of them were swept overboard trying to get into the lifeboats. In 1973, the wreck of the Monitor was discovered off the coast of North Carolina, and there it remains, a silent memorial to the men who died. Their names are for history. And so long as we remain a people, so long will the work of the Monitor be remembered and her story told to our children's children. The little cheese box on a raft has made a name for herself, a name that will not soon be forgotten by the American people. Grenville Weeks, USS Monitor. Although neither ship survived a year of service, their designs inspired the North, the South, and the entire world to convert their navies from wood to iron. <laughs> 